You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. To the outside world, my mum was a doting parent. But behind four walls, I'm afraid it was nothing like that. I was um, abused in every shape and form. And I didn't know them in them days. I just thought that was life. That was the life that we all have, you know what I mean? And then she uh, sometimes used to touch me inappropriately, apart from the beatings. And uh, it was, everything was mental torture. I got told a lot of times, you shouldn't be here, Anne should be here. That was my sister who died. I was told a lot of times, we don't want you. And uh, I think that it all added up in the end. And to be fair, I think that I've done well. I come out of it as good as I have done, considering what it was like. And I can only describe it, looking back now, L. I had loads of good people around me. And, and to be fair, like I've said, it, not every one of them was a fighter, but they all had amazing bottle and they would never leave me like I would never leave them. There's no one on this planet can say I ever left a man down. If a man went down, I picked him up. Who's the strongest form you've ever come up against? I think Millwall. I think Millwall won a couple of them games we played. How many people? Oh. <sighs> More than 300 a side, you know what I mean? But they had a lot, They they when we went over there, they used to all turn out. Like I said, the two things that I regret is not keeping in touch with my daughter and the other one was being born. They're the two things I regret. I, I, I couldn't change. You know, I, I didn't ask to come into this world. And if I, I was given the choice, I wouldn't. Simple. And people say, yeah, all that and never got done. No, no. Find somebody who says they did me. Yeah, that's the challenge. I put out to all you, all you people are listening. Find someone. Find someone who give me a good idea. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Bill Gardner. How are you, Bill? Thanks, James. Yeah, thanks nice for coming on. Lovely. West Ham legend. Been yeah. in the tennis his many, many years. Yeah. Very well known in the game. First and foremost, how are you, brother? I'm all right. Yeah? I'm all right, thank you. You've just released your new book as well, The Man, The Myth, The Legend. Yeah, it came out on uh, November. It's been doing well. This is your second book? Um, it, yeah. Yeah, I done one with Cass. Yeah. How was that then? What, the first one or the second, second one? Second one. The second one was, I wouldn't have done a second one, but the, the fellow helped me write it, Abe, I know him as Moza. He, he didn't want to do the typical football hard man books, and I didn't want to do that either. I wanted to tell people what my life was like that led to that, you know, that led to me to be the way maybe I was, which was the way my life's mapped out. It was all down to the beginning. Yeah, you've led a very interesting life. Homeless as well as a kid. Yeah, I was Quite a tough 14. upbringing. Yeah. I always go back to the start of my guest, Bill. Where you grew up and how it all began to get a better understanding of yourself. Um, I was born in Old Church in Essex. Um, my dad worked at Folds. And my mum um, didn't work a lot. And um, I was the only child of them. They'd lost their daughter before me. And... Um, I saw like come along and I I wasn't wanted. But to the outside world, my mum was a doting parent. But behind four walls, I'm afraid it was nothing like that. I was um, abused in every shape and form. Not by my dad. My dad never laid hand on me. Uh, but uh, my mum certainly did. She used to bash me with a broom handle and this big lump of rubber. And I, I used to get it for doing nothing. You know, I wasn't a bad kid. Um, she got she got the police to come round once. She, I don't know why, but she got him to come round once. And, uh, and from about ten to fourteen, when I left, the cop never stopped bothering me. He see me on the corner of a road. He see me playing football. He try and pick fault. And um, in all fairness, I was doing nothing more than any other kid was doing at that time. And then my mum had a, a serious operation. And she walked out while she was still under the anaesthetic and walked home from Romford Hall Church and her, her nightdress was covered in blood. And uh, it, it, we think it turned her. 
and uh, in all fairness, um, I couldn't live much longer there because she tried to stab me and my dad one night. She come through the door with a knife, bread knife. It was like a scene from The Shining. So my dad said, you've got to go. He said, if you don't go, she's going to kill you. So I, I give it about two or three weeks, got together a few bits and uh, give it some thought, thought where am I going to go. And uh, I lived in a graveyard in a, a church in Allgate. And I lived in there for 10 months, except for one night when I managed to get into a refuge. But uh, the one night was enough for me because you have to hold your things because they try and nick them off you. I had a bag, they tried to nick it. So I got talking to a couple of people and they said, yeah, if you want some work, you go to Finchley Road Station in the morning and you wait there and the builders come round and say, you know, they want three or four men. And I was big for my age, well, really was, you know. And um, I worked with some gypsies from Hertfordshire, worked for them for quite a few months and uh, learnt how to do tarmacking and laying curbs in a road, which I had my own business in the end doing that. And uh, I done a pit fighting, where you go down in a hole 12 foot by 12 foot, go in a ladder, and the one who gets out wins the money. People bet on you and all that. And uh, I done quite well with that money. And uh, I had four fights. I won four, but one of them was a brute. He looked like the bloke from, uh, in the film, The 300, when they pulled a bloke along with the chains, he looked like him. And I thought, at first I looked and I thought, oh no. What you've done here, you idiot, you know? And then I thought, well, hold on, look at the state of him. His ears were battered, his nose, his head. I thought, no, I can do him. And then well, I went out there, I whacked him, first of all, in the bollocks, and he was wearing them as earrings. And I thought, well, and as his head come down, I caught him with a beauty, and I knew with the second one he was gone. And I, I didn't take liberties. He put his hand up and said he had enough, and that went, that was how it used to end. You either said enough or you knocked him out. So he said enough, and uh, I climbed out and grabbed me dough, and... Uh, got away a bit rapid, you know, because when you've got all them sort of characters out there, it's, they're not uh, the gentlemen, you know what I mean? They're, so I, I started off and I used to hide the money in the wall in the church. There was a hole. No one would have ever found it. In fact, some of it was still there three years later when I went back. And uh, I used to use part of it to live. And it was a lot of money. It was a fair bit of money at the time. I mean, a lot of people said to me, you could have got a, a flat for that money, bought a flat in them days for that money, and I most probably could have done. But if I walked into a, a building society or somewhere and said, yeah, hey, it's six grand cash, they're on the phone to the police. And as I was on the run, I couldn't do that. So I just had to be try and be a bit wise, keep the dough, and then when things sorted out a few years later, I bought my first car with it. That was a disaster. Why? Well, it never went. I had a car that never went. <laughs> <laughs> I think half a daily sold it to me. But no, it was all right. It was all right. I didn't regret it. It was, it was a learning curve for me. Must have been sad though, Paul, like to be Not, uh, abandoned yeah, at that it's, age it's, to then be homeless. It was... Um, I, was I had a bit of cover over me, like concrete from the, the church. And I used to, obviously you learn very quick when you're outside what to do. So what I did, I had cardboard. I used to sit on cardboard Um I had two changes of clothes, and when I used to work, um, if I got wet, the first thing I used to do was try and find a swimming pool, go in a swimming pool, get clean, wash my clothes, and then I hung them up on uh, a nail that was in the wall to a fence. And But in the winter, they don't dry, so you put your clothes on in the morning, just a little bit less wet than it was the night before. That was tough, and I used to sit there, and I'll be honest with you, I used to get tearful, and I used to think, where do you go from here? And I could have gone to drink and drugs, but I never did. In fact, uh, I never took a drink until I was about 50. Uh, I've always been teetotal and always like trained and that. And, um, you know, now I'm 67, nearly 68. And uh, but being outside in all them weathers, it don't do you no good in the end. You know, when I see my boys going out with hardly nothing on, I say, look, get, some, get a coat on or something. I say, you can always take it off because you end up ill. And Why did you not drink then, Bill? Was that because your mum and dad drank? No, they never drank. Never drank no, either? No, they no, no, both never drank. Um, I just never liked the taste, in all fairness. Um, it wasn't for me and drugs weren't for me. And uh, my, I, I regard my life as being really boring. I know some people find my life... Uh, I, I believe my upbringing was terrible, 
But I don't think my life's been that terrible. I'm, I'm, we've been with the same girl now for nearly 40 years and we're really happy. I've got two, uh, three kids, but the, my daughter I don't see no more it's from my first marriage. And uh, in all fairness, that's, I've got two regrets and one of them is not keeping in touch with her and trying to get through the, the barriers that were put up for me not to see her. So at the end of the day, uh, that's how that worked. And then obviously I used to look forward, the six days I was stuck there doing that, I used to work five, sometimes three. If they didn't need me, obviously I wouldn't get no work for the day. And uh, I just used to look forward to going to football. With West Ham, I regarded my mates at West Ham as my family. What about schooling? Did you ever go to school, Bill? Yeah, I went to school. I mean, I'll be honestly truthful with you. I'm uh, I'm not an uneducated person because I used to read a lot. I used to read a lot of books on a lot of subjects. And when I went back to school and I'd done the tests, because once I, once they captured me, the, the social services captured me in the graveyard, they put me in care in Church, and I went back to school. Uh, obviously, I had a lot of catching up to do. But I used to finish in the top three in the class and I never went to school. So, you know, I thought myself, hold on, maybe reading the books has done you some good. You know, I'm very good at history, geography, um, general knowledge, hopeless at maths, hopeless at English, to be fair with you. But, you know, I'm quite good on them subjects and I always had a big interest in sport and football, you know, with doing the boxing, the taekwondo, wrestling, I've done a bit of everything. I really enjoyed it. When did you fall in love with West Ham? I was five years old. My dad was a Spurs fan. He used to take me to Tottenham back in 61. Sorry, I was seven years old. Um, and uh, they had a great team there. They won the double and they, 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 they was good. But I never felt comfortable there. I never felt comfortable there. I never did. And uh, we'd go Tottenham one week, West Ham another. Um, I think he only used to take me to West Ham the other week to get, get out the house away from me mother, you know. So at the end of the day, when I went over there, I really enjoyed it. I loved the people. I felt at home, you know. And then as I got older and I met, met, met different people from different generations, I regarded them as my family. You know, I've been let down a few times by a few people over there, but basically they've all been all right. Yeah, that's the main thing, but yeah. you're always going to get... I've got friends that go back 50 years that I've known play football with them you know what I mean as a kid mm -hmm. but and they're still my friends now and you know you, you know yourself as you get older you make new friends new generations of people and I'm now friends with kids that are the sons of dads whose dads I was friendly with so it's gone like three generations which is amazing yeah a long time yeah. what age did you get off the streets Bill? well when they captured me I was uh, 15, uh, I was 14 and a half when I went, I was about 15 and a half I was. I went back to school uh, um, the first term of the other year. They took me back to school because obviously they wanted to see if I learned anything, you know, what I was going to do. And the careers lady said to me, the most you can hope for is a job in Romford Market. And I thought, well, yeah, I'll show you, I can do better than that. And I did. So... Uh, you know, I run my own business, I had a few people working for me and uh, had a great reputation. I had the best reputation on checkertrade.com um, and um, when I retired a couple of years ago, I gave the business to my son James and he's doing well. Good name. Yeah. <laughs> what business were you doing, Bill? We do um, hard landscaping, like uh, driveways, patios, turfing and fencing in the Surrey area where I live now. And when did you start? Because I, I know the, like the football hooligans and the ICF, you've never really associated with no, that? I'm no, I was never in the ICF. People have put me in about 30 books saying that I was in that. I was not. Even the police who nicked me said I was, but I was not. I've never been in a gang. I, I go my own path. I go my own route. And that's the only way. Then, like anything else, like you said before we had the interview, is trust. And I couldn't trust many people. I do now. I, do, I trust quite a few. But, you know... At the, at the end of the day, I um, I was a loner. I was a loner that had a lot of friends, a lot of people that liked me, used to hang around with me, but we wasn't no part of any named gang and we never sat around no table plotting violence. 
we went to football and if somebody tried to stop us going to football that was it that's when it went off and I think that can be said the same for a lot of teams and a lot of people it's like I, I wasn't having it I couldn't uh, stand there and watch my friends who I called my family getting hurt you know there's right and wrong I know right from wrong you know what I mean and uh, at the end of the day I thought you know this is the path I've got to take and it was the path I did take and it led to me being nicked and 16 weeks and two days in the high court on trial till they found out the evidence has been fabricated and uh, that was that but they still never forget you know they I can sit in the stand sometimes and you feel like somebody's got their eyes on you and I look down and they're looking up you know, waiting for me to do something or say something wrong but they won't get it I'm afraid uh, they got no chance of that so they might as well look somewhere else yeah. you know what uh, public enemy number one at, at some at point at one stage I think I was in the top five in the country that they was after but they had to frame me up by telling lies you know and I, I ain't saying I didn't do it because I just said I did but not when they said I did yeah, I wasn't doing it when my boy was born that was it for me I didn't want him to grow up without a dad I didn't want him to go to school and say your old man's in prison I didn't want it you know some people are, are, are proud of that thing yeah I've been a nick and my boy's like yeah not me I don't want that for my family do you remember your first tear up Bill? First tear up was at primary school. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, we, with another lad there that I was quite friendly with. Um, one of them things, then I joined the boxing club and started doing a bit there at Elm Park Boxing Club and they're nice people. Did you enjoy it, the fighting, or was it just to more to defend yourself, especially being homeless? I enjoyed the fighting. I enjoyed the fighting. I enjoy competition. You know what I mean? I, I like competition. Combat? Yeah. Yeah. What about for West Ham? Um, it was a thing that had to be done for me. I, it wasn't a, a case of taking a backward step. You know, if, if some loads of them in front of us bouncing up and down, they didn't bounce up and down too much. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like I say, you know, I, um, it's just the way it was. Life was like that for a lot of us, for every team, you know. I'm good mates with a Chelsea fan now. He was about the same age as me. And he, he said the same, you know. It was our generation of things. Every generation has something, doesn't it? I mean, I think this current generation are all wired up on their uh, iPads and their phones and then getting out their knives and sharpening them, what I can make of it, where every day you hear of a stabbing somewhere or other. Do you remember your first tear-up with West Ham? <sighs> Blimey. I must have been 12. 12? Yeah, 12, yeah. I think 12 away somewhere. Would have been about when I was 12. Um, it might have been Birmingham. What was that experience like? Pretty frightening, to be fair with you. You know what I mean? I wasn't new to it, but it was uh, it was different, you know, the atmosphere. And it wasn't one person in front of me, there was lots. So I just watched the people near me and... Um, I might have to do you know, just have a go you know I'm a little boy I'm 12 years old but I, w I was quite big at 12 I most probably looked 16 17 when I was 14 I looked 20 you know what I mean I had a, I had a full growth of uh, air on my face in them days and my hair I'm aired at the time but I don't know, that's disappeared now but um, it was just the way my life was yeah, the way it panned out you know I mean I, I, I wouldn't sit here for one minute and say I was a villain, I was a criminal, I was a gangster. I weren't none of them things. I weren't none of them. I was a survivor. I survived. When I used to live outside, I used to make sure I had everything I needed. Uh, a Swiss army knife, a pair of scissors, um, some nylon string. Um, I had a crystal radio. I don't, even, I don't you know what crystal radio no. is? Crystal radio, is, it was about that big, and you wind it up. It has no batteries. You wind it up, and it goes for about half an hour then you have to wind it up again but I had that and that was part of my little bag I had when I left home and a tin opener because obviously I needed to, in them days didn't have ring pulls you had to open them up and that I had more HP beans out of a can most probably than the beans they put in at the factory <laughs> god because you know you, you must could, have been farting like fuck <laughs> oh mate I think that's why they kept away from me I think. but no it's, it was just the way life was for me you know what I mean yeah it, was, uh, it wasn't easy. And like I say, when I, I found 
when I was like the 12 year old, the, the young lad, I followed this group of men up the road at Derby County when we played. And they was all 20 years older than me. And I thought, well, these are the people to be with. And uh, one bloke was barking out the orders for us what to do. And I thought, well, this sounds all right. And, and I followed him and the poor old boy, he's now dead. Like a lot of them are, you know, they, you get to that stage. But I I had loads of good people around me. And, and to be fair, like I've said, not every one of them was a fighter. But they all had an amazing bottle. And they would never leave me like I would never leave them. There's no one on this planet that can say I ever left a man down. If a man went down, I picked him up. And it was the same when I worked on the door. If a doorman went down, I'd pick him up. It was West Ham the first time you'd ever felt part of a family? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I always felt unwanted at home. We never had a Christmas. Our Christmases were uh, no trees, no no decorations. We used to get a present. I used to get a present. My dad used to get a pair of slippers every year. He had so many slippers. I think he could open the shoe shop. And then they'd have a fight. They'd always have a fight on a Christmas day because my mum was seeing another man opposite and she used to cook the dinner over there and bring it back on a tray for me and my dad. And... Uh, um, He'd say something to her about come come home here or something. I think my dad really loved her because I don't know any man would have stood at what he did. She carried on with this bloke for thirty years. I, I called him Uncle Ted. He was all right. He was a nice fella, but you know, I was I was a kid. I didn't know right from wrong. You know what I mean? I didn't know that part of it, marriage and all that. I didn't understand that bit. And I just thought, oh, Uncle Ted's a friend, and that was it. But I used to. Um, I used to play them around a bit because I used to, when I got a little bit on a bit, I was about, how old would I be? I'd be about 12. I used to I used to go over there and he'd say, yeah, you going anywhere, Bill? And I'd, I think, oh, they want me out of the way to get at it, you know what I mean? I used to say, no, I want one going to pictures. And he'd go, how much is that? And I'd say, oh, three shillings. Oh, all right. So I said, how am I going to get there then? He said, oh, how much is the bus? And I'd say, oh, two shillings and I, I said I'll be hungry when I come out he said what, what do you want I said well fish and chips so I'd get the fish and chips money I'd get the ice cream money out and some sweets mm -hmm. and I used to go down the road and I reckon before I got on the bus they was at it you know what I mean they actually would got at it in the bed next to me when I was a little little boy really little six I was in bed asleep and I heard my, my cot was going because I slept in a cot till I was eight and I, I felt this shaking, and I looked round, and he was on top of me, mum, giving away. And he went, shh, go back to sleep. Yeah. And I didn't know them in them days. I just thought that was life. That was the life that we all have, you know what I mean? And then she uh, sometimes used to touch me inappropriately, apart from the beatings. And uh, it was, everything was mental torture. I got told a lot of times, you shouldn't be here, Anne should be here. That was my sister who died. I was told a lot of times, we don't want you. And uh, I think that it all added up in the end. And to be fair, I think that I've done well. I come out of it as good as I have done, considering what it was like. And I can only describe it, looking back now, L. It was L. Yeah, but like I say, Bill, you, you've, you're a legend, man. Everybody knows you. Everybody's got massive yeah, but respect I'm, I, well, for you. Well, I ain't a legend for finding a cure for cancer, am I? Yeah, I know. You know what I mean? A legend for what? Having a fight at a football match. For being homeless at 14 and coming through it, starting your own business, building a network of friends, building trust, mm. like being loyal to what you believe in. I, 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 like, loyalty and honour is the two main things in my life. Loyalty mm. and honour. Without them things, you know, you've got nothing. You might as well write them out of the dictionary now because not many people have got them. Yeah. Courage, loyalty and honour. Did you did that fuel you with a lot of anger going through your teenage years and getting into your 20s, Bill? Not really. Not really, to be fair. I sort of like put it to one side. You, When you have things like that happen to you, you, you put it to the side of your mind and you get on with your life. And uh, that's what I did, you know. I thought, was, I thought myself, oh, I don't know. You know, this, this ain't what it's got to be about. One night I was um, in the graveyard and there was a hole in the, the, the fence I could get through and there was no other way in. And I was sitting there and all of a sudden I heard this noise and this bloke sat in a chair about where you are from me now. And I looked at him and I thought, was he, is, he, what, is he another pisshead or what is he? You know what I mean? And he, we started talking and he said to me, you won't be beaten but you'll die a terrible death. That's 
So what this thing said to me, this bloke said to me. And, and, and I thought, I said, oh, no, I won't tell him to fuck off in a minute. And I looked around, he'd gone. As quick as he came, he went. But that's what he said to me. You'll never be beaten, but you'll die a terrible death. And I always remembered that. I always remember my whole life. That was one of the things I always remembered. That's a lot of torment, but that's a lot of mental abuse as well as physical. Oh, like, oh, right. did you ever speak to anyone about that? When I when I was uh, at primary school, I was very low on confidence. Used to get bullied a lot, and I got bullied so many times that they sent me to see this doctor Brown to have hypnotherapy, and he only done it on two kids: one boy from uh, Burnley and me. And I went in there and the first couple of sessions, I thought, oh, this is nothing. You know, I didn't think it did nothing. And after I'd have a few sessions, I used to come out there feeling different. And from being like everyone bullying me, I become, I stuck up for myself. And I, that's one of the things I've always been for, to stop bullying anybody. Because either they're fat or they're ginger or they wear glasses. You know what I mean? I hate bullies. I hate bullies. I will fight bullies all day long and I'll fight until I go in that box. Simple as that. But I had one boy there at school, primary school, he used to really have it in for me. And uh, I didn't see him till I was 18 years old and I went up to him and I said, hello, mate. And he looked at me like he didn't know me. I said, uh, he said, sorry, I don't recognise you. I said, I went to school with you. I sat next to you and he looked at me and he went, oh, Bill Garden. I went, yeah, that's right. But he didn't say it, oh, oh, Bill Garden. He said it in a, a way that was... Um, you lump of shit, you know what I mean? So I punched him in the mouth, he's gone down. Has he got anything to say now? And he went, no. So I went off. And I felt good about that, that all the grief he gave me, the times he used to push me off the chair, you know, I thought, I've got my own back now. And that was it. I won't take liberties with people. If I beat them, I walk away. That's it. I don't take liberties. I'm not a liberty taker. I fight fair, you know. Always have done. Yeah, it's changed days now, Bo. Yeah, it is. How many West Ham games do you think you've been to over oh, the years? I've been going 62 years. Um, obviously, I was banned for four years. I couldn't go to them four years. And I've most probably missed 30 in all the other years I've been going. And that's only the way I go. Europe, you know, if we play uh, pre-season tournaments in Spain, Austria, I go all them. And uh, the games we have played in Europe, I've gone to all them. And... Uh, the clubs are very special to me. Not this place we play now, I hate it, and I don't like the owners now. But I'm not one of them that goes on about, we've got to spend millions and millions and millions. I, I'm, I want the club to bring in youth, go out, get a good scouting network, bring all the best young players in and, and make a team like that, you know, so that they're homegrown and you, 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 know, you, you, you can get um, proud of them. I mean, like, we've got Declan Rice who plays for us now. I know Declan, Declan's mum and dad quite well, so I go to New York with them once a year. We see each other out there. And um, he's a nice lad, and I, I wish him well, and I think he'd be the next one to go from West Ham because he's ambitious, he wants to win things, and it don't look like we'll win things. It's Europe this year, but I don't think they will get carried away too much. It won't last long. We, we're West Ham, you know, we ain't, we ain't them big clubs that win things. Yeah, well, he's a good boy Declan when yeah, we went to Germany um, we had a coach and he got on the coach and he shook everyone's hand on the coach and thanked us all for coming and when my mate Dennis God bless him died last year with cancer he went round Dennis's house and saw him and it made Dennis his day you know and he done the same for another friend I've now got Chaz who's got a brain tumour and he sent him a message and all he's a genuine nice fellow and I wish him well yeah He's not we really happy that he's getting to Europe. Is that the only third, third time West Ham's been in Europe, finishing sixth last season? Um, 75 6 we went. We went 80 81, and then we went um, before in 65. And uh, I went to the home games, but not the away games in them days. What was your first away game for West Ham? Um, at Middlesbrough. Do you remember it? Yeah, I remember the train full of people. The last, the last two games. Of the 58 promotion season I went to, I was nearly five. Um, Middlesbrough and Liverpool, yeah. We did. Why ever took me up to Middlesbrough? Because you know what? Middlesbrough's known as, as the nonsense capital of Europe, but Middlesbrough's a bad place. <laughs> and I think he took me up there for some reason. I don't know. But I ended up coming back, and I remember the train was full of uh, all, the, all the claret and blue colours were everywhere. And uh, it, 
I, I enjoyed it. I felt this is me. You know what I mean? I felt, you know, I was only a little boy, like I said, but I felt I like this. This is what I want to do. You've been there for generations now. Like, firms must have changed through the years. How do you feel it is for 40 years ago to now? Well, now, over at that new stadium, that's your toll we've got now, which I hate, is um, we've got all these tourists. They have a day out. They go to Madame Tussauds. They have a bit of lunch. They go to West Ham. It's their day out. They get in there. They have a two-gallon packet of uh, popcorn, a ink bucket of Coca-Cola. You know what I mean? And they've got, not got the passion that the older ones have got. We could still be a big club. I think we could still be a big club. The fans need to get behind the team. Although we hate the board, we need to get behind the team more. And I think if we do, we, it, we'd make it a better day out for everyone and all. You know, everyone goes home with the ump. But if you have a laugh in the day, it's not so bad, you know. That's the way I look at it. And uh, But I don't like it over there. The walk to it, for older people, the walk is like a day's exercise on its own. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I do a lot of walking and uh, cycling. And uh, my day's exercise is getting there and back. You know, that's the way it's become now. But, uh, you hated Millwall. I don't think you spoke to a Millwall fan in over 50 no, years, is that no, correct? No, I, I didn't. And then I've got two mates that are Millwall fans now. Uh, they're just a little bit younger than me and they're and really nice people. But we never got on. It was, it's the same with them. They say the same. And uh, uh, I, um, I had a phone call from a, a mate of mine who runs, I'm not sure if it's Fairburn House Boxing or West Ham Boxing Club, and he was in hospital visiting Tiny, who was one of the top people over at Millwall. And he said, I'm in hospital with Tiny. He's uh, got a growth in his neck the size of a grapefruit. He said, and uh, could you have a word with him? And I thought, so, what do you say to your enemy? You know what I mean? So I got on the phone to him and I said, look, I'm ever so sorry you are like you are. If there's anything I can do to help, I will. We've always been enemies and we always will be but I've got respect for you and I always know you was tiny the, the lion of Millwall and uh, my mate got back to me and said he's in tears and I thought myself that and people said to me why did you say that why didn't you say you were a right cunt I said no well, you can't say that to a man who's dying you've got to have a bit of respect you know and uh, the, the poor bugger went you know but uh, well, I don't know when you get older you hear more and more people go with it Young people don't think they're ever going to get it. No, they're not going to get this COVID. Believe me, you, you're going to you, you will cop it if you don't ain't careful. Especially when they're all over each other. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What about who's the strongest form you've ever come up against? I think Millwall. I think Millwall in a couple of them games we played. How many people? Oh, more than three hundred a side. You know what I mean? But they had a lot. They they when we went over there, they used to all turn out, and I got I got nothing but respect for them. I think that they're all right. You know, they got um, they're quite humorous. They've done a few funny things with like the uh, they had an helicopter go over Buck Wigan with uh, Avron Grant hero. I think Avron Grant. <laughs> what's that? What's that experience? And what's that adrenaline when it's three hundred against three hundred? Like, <coughs> is it just a free for all or? Yeah, free for all, really. Like they say in the film Zulu, mark your target when they come. You know what I mean? You, you know which one you're going to have. I always used to go for the one at the front who was the mouthy one. I used to always go for that one because I always believe you take off the top of the, you, you cut the tree at the bottom, the tree will fall. So that's what I used to do. But a lot of them books that people have written in about me, unbelievable. How many, many books do you think you've been in? About 30. About 30 where they've given me a mention. Um, I would say 28 of them are packs of lies. Um, they're just people that are looking to get their ego going. You know what I mean? I, my book's truth, that hundred percent truth, every word. I don't know. I didn't have to glamorize it, sensationalize it. You know, mm. people say about me in there and people talk about me and I get all this, they say, like, you know, what I was and what I wasn't that, but that was what I was. That ain't what I'm like now. You know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a family man. I, I, I live in the country. I like, I do country things, you know? Change days, Bill. Yeah, yeah. You seem to have a heavy heart, though, as well. You seem to be carrying a lot of pain, and I can understand that through the life that you've led at the very start. You seem very emotional. 
when you talk yeah, about that. Yeah, I am. That I am. And, uh, you know, in my, in my other film I did, I did get emotional a couple of times. But um, uh, if you live that life, you would have, carry something with you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I said, the two things that I regret is not keeping in touch with my daughter and the other one would be being born. They're the two things I regret. I, I, I couldn't change. You know, I, I didn't ask to come into this world. And if I was given the choice, I wouldn't. Simple. Why? I'm just not happy. You know, I'm, not, I'm happy with my girlfriend. I'm happy with my kids. I'm happy when I got a football. But deep inside, I'm not happy. Who would be? You know, who would be when you, you took beatings off you, people who should love you? Never put their arm around me once. All right, son. Never come and watch me play football, my dad, till I was 26. My last game. He come and watch me and I scored and I was well happy doing that. But just like not not having nothing, you know? Not having nothing. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big hoarder now. My, I, I, I collect things now that I should have had when I was a kid, which I, don't, I didn't have. And I think that's what it is. I've got that regret of not having, not having that lifestyle. But she kept it a big, big secret. Everyone thought she was the, the gloating mum, you know? Never thought, never, unbelievable, unbelievable. Just feel as if you you were neglected your whole childhood. That well, they used to feed me, they used to clothe me, you know what I mean? Uh, I, I had no, um, no love. But I, sometimes I feel guilty for the way they was to me. I, I've, I've said to Mozzie when we done the book, I, I'd like to apologise. He said, why? Why should you apologise? They did it to you, not you do to them. And I understood that, but I go to my mum and dad's grave every four weeks. I clean it. I change the flowers because they have, uh, I don't put fresh flowers on. I put pl- uh, plastic ones, but I put different ones on. She used to like uh, lots of colours, so uh, a grave used to look like a Rastafarian's died there. You know, it was loads of colour. But at the end of the day, uh, I do that as a mark of respect, as part of respect. You know, they was my mum and dad. And I, I, and I still love them, you know what I mean? I think that shows your character, though, that everything you've went through and you're still showing that loyalty to someone who oh. treated you badly. If somebody's a friend for me, they're a friend for life, and I will do anything for them. I will lay my life on the line for a friend. You don't get many people like that anymore. Like <laughs> everybody's out to get... Yeah, what they can, yeah. make a few quid. Yeah. I've met a few like that that want to try and make a few quid or use my name and make a few quid. But at the end of the day... Uh, it's part of life, it's water under the bridge. You learn and you move on, you know? I'm not one for uh, being upset for years and years because somebody's had me over for a few quid or nothing like that. But what I do is, I never give it in, I never give nothing in. So if I was to take a really bad beating and I'd be in hospital for a year, I guarantee within two years I'll get my own back. They have to kill me to beat me. As simple as that, I will not be beaten. There's something in me that says, no, no, you've had enough. You keep on fighting. And that's what I do. Whether or not it's to do with me children, bit, bit, uh, bit with me childhood, I don't know. I think a lot of people, if I sat down with somebody, they might say, all oh, this is due to your childhood, you know? But uh, I've never ever looked at it like that, in all fairness. You know, I just got on with life. Did you go to Russia with West Ham? Yeah. What was that experience like? Oh, unbelievable. Uh, Nine inches of snow in Moscow and 70 degrees in Tbilisi when we went down there. Yeah. What was the score? We won 1-0. We were 4-1 down. They're the best team I've ever seen at West Ham. They were fantastic. What year was that? I don't know. It must be 81-2, I think, something like that, wasn't it? Tbilisi. Yeah, because with the 76, we played um, Armenian team. And yeah, Dynamo to the police area, but it's 4-1 at home and they were fantastic. And anyone was there would say they were just unbelievable. But to beat them 1-0, I think they took the foot off the gas. But there was, um, I think there was 400 of us went out there all together. We was all on the coaches and the, when we went in the ground, everyone had a uniform on. In them days, it was the days of, you know, the Soviet Union. And... Uh, we had a row of people in uniforms in front, a row of us, a row of uniforms, a row of us. But they could have been postmen. You know what I mean? It was no. this, but they, they had a big sign, Welcome to the Sportsman of England, along the side of the, the, long, long, long the, side of the ground. And we treated us very well. Russians are all right. 
They used to come knocking on your door. Do you want to change money up on the black market? You get four times as much money off the matey boy knocking on the door than you did in the bureau change. So they bought everything, jumpers, bags, you name it. We, 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 we knew when we went out there what it'd be like. So there was chewing gum, so I loved the chewing gum. And cassettes, you know, the old cassettes. Oh, God, I mean, I hated Elton John. I bought four of them in the airport, <laughs> knocked them out. Yeah, unbelievable. They, uh, they, they were a funny bunch. And they, they're, uh, in them days, they was very oppressed people. We went on a coach trip and me and my mate Steve Bean, we went down on the uh, metro. And the, the metro in Moscow is unbelievable. It's chandeliers everywhere and it's marble. It is lovely. It's, it's really a pleasure to go down there. And uh, yeah, it was good. I enjoyed that. West Ham have had some legends play for them. You get Bobby Moore, Frank McAvaney, I've yeah. got to give a shout yeah. out to my brother Frank, yeah. Tony Cotties, yeah. Julian Dix, Tevez, Frank Lampard. Loads of them, yeah. Who's the best player you've ever seen? For me, in my lifetime, I'm going to have to go for Bobby Moore because he couldn't run, he couldn't head, but he was the best because he was three steps ahead of everyone. He was the best player I've, I've seen, but I also liked Di Canio and Tevez. I like them a lot, and Trevor Brookin. With, with a West Ham fan can name a team of lousy players quicker than he can name a team of good players. We could name eight teams of bad ones and about three teams of good ones. That's yeah. the way it is. That's the, what it's like, West Ham. Look, I know a mill bloke like said to me once, you're glory hunters. Well, I like to know where the glory is because I ain't seen it, and nor have a lot of people my age and generation. You know, they've just not seen that. I, I'd, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see us playing the Champions League, just one game. Even if it was like a preliminary round, you know. Just one game and I'd die happy man. Simple as that. But, you know, they done well last year and I'll, I'll go to the European Games this year and look forward to it. But yeah. like I say, my two mates are really bad who I normally go with. Well, I say one's dead and one's not good. And uh, they'd be solely missed. Why do you think the Canu was so loved, even though for a short passion. stint at West Ham? Passion. He had passion. He, it was like one of us out there playing, you know. He, all teams have this this uh, one player or two players that come along in a generation that have got passion for their club. A, any football sport you ask will always have these people. You know, I mean, the Man United liked Di Canio, didn't they? Not Di Canio. Um, what's his name? The Frenchman. Cantona. Cantona. You know, he had passion. I mean, you, there's been plenty of them, you know. I remember the Canio's goal against Manchester United, the scissor kick. Yeah. And it right in the bottom And against corner. Wimbledon. Yeah. You don't want to get Wimbledon. Yeah, there's, there's been some players. Why do you think the, the West Ham fans are so loyal as well, even though you've not had any success? I think it's down to originating where we come from. West Ham is a working class team from working class area. Um, a lot of the people used to work at on the docks or at Fords, like my dad. My dad worked at Fords. My uncle and my granddad were Stevie Doors on the docks. And that was before they had big cranes to lift the stuff up. They used to stick the hook in the bananas, put the bananas on their back and carry them up the ladder. I, I had a picture of my uh, my uncle. He was a circus strongman, my uncle. And I got one of a big banana strip fighter on his, on his jacket. Unbelievable. But they was, out, they was always striking. They'd be outside the gates. People used to come out, we want 10 people for the sugar boat. And, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd get picked or they didn't. If they didn't, they went in the pub and got pissed. That's what they did. My, my uncle was a fiercely strong man. He, he lifted a grand piano above his head. And um, I saw him lift two blokes up. Um, two blokes were sitting in chairs and he picked them up by the back legs of the chair like this. He was a... He was... He was... Six foot tall and about eight foot wide. He was so big and strong, you know what I mean? He had muscles on his arms, like tops of my legs. He was big. And uh, he was like the black wolf of our family. I, I, um, I used to get on well with him, to be fair. He died He died in old people's home, racing an old girl to the toilet on Zimmer frame. <laughs> they, they banged into each other. He went over it, his head and died. Yeah. Shut. Yeah, what a way to go. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, no, it's that them days... I don't know. I don't, I don't regret regret anything. If I if I did go back and what I, my life I've had, I wouldn't change one minute of it because I I think I've done more good than bad in my life. And uh, whether or not I'll go up there or down there, 
like I say, we're, we're we'll have to wait and see if there's anywhere we do go. But uh, if I go down there, you better watch out. Like I said, I ain't coming fucking peacefully. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, uh, if you're going anywhere, Bill, I can guarantee it'll be a good place, man. You've got such a good soul. Like, I don't know you so many people, but you're a good man. Like, you're loyal. I can feel your passion. You. you wear your heart on your sleeve. Like, yeah. I can feel your emotion. I can feel this is emotional for you. Like, yeah. you've been through some shit, but you're still here fighting, and that shows your true character. Like, thank you. There's not many people like that. A lot of people would have jumped out and pulled the string quicker to get to fuck because yeah. that's a painful experience to the shit that you've went through. Yeah. But that shows how strong a man you are. Still here, thank you. nearly 68. Well loved, well respected. Two books out. You've been mentioned in many other books. That that's people want to be surrounded by you. They want to mention you because it gives them some credit. Yeah. But that shows you what you've achieved in life. Yeah. And you might not feel it, but there'll be a lot of people look up to you for inspiration. Remember yeah. a kid who was homeless to run his own business? Yeah. That takes massive courage to not let life defeat him. Yeah, I would like to I'd like to uh, help people that are like that. You know what I mean? I've always said to my Sarah, I said, one, one Christmas, why don't we go and help these people who got nothing? But you have to fill in so many bits of paper. It's like all red tape and that. And now nah, let's give it a miss. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I would like to do that. I'd like to help kids that are down on their luck because what people don't know is everyone on the street, not all of them, are there for a good reason. A lot of youngsters are there for the same reasons I went through and there's thousands of people like it. But what I, what I learned was that when somebody's on the street, you always look, if they've got clean hands, they're not homeless because you do get dirty hands. You know you wash them, they get dirty quickly, you know. And like I say, when I was homeless, I never ever put the hat out for any money. I never ponced. I worked. And uh, that's the way I w I've always looked. I've always worked. I've never ponced or made money out of anything dodgy or nothing like that. I've, I've, led, a, I've, I've, I've led a squeaky clean life, to be fair, as far as that's concerned. Um, but I was just like, the, you know, I, I was in uh, Greece one year and... Uh, this old lady was outside the restaurant, all her hands bandaged up. She's in the curb screaming. And I was eating, and I said, the state of her, like, so she said, yeah, it's bad, isn't it? I said, I'm going to give her some money. So I went out, and I'll give her 10 euros or something. And uh, the next night, we're at the top of the island, which you can only get to by car, and she's come round the tables again. And I thought, hold on a minute. So what I did is I followed her around the back, and she was having a divvy up with her money. So I sat down, and she came round to my table, I said, look, lady, I'll give you 10 euros the other night. Fuck off. Because I knew she was con. You know, she's conning us all. She wasn't homeless at all. But you can always tell with them, you, you know, the clean look. or the, they, A lot of them use the dog now. Yeah, but, but that gets you, me. If you're homeless, how can you afford to feed your dog, you know? And there are some genuine ones out there. But I, I would like to help the youngsters and show them that the streets of London ain't paved with gold. They're paved with cold, you know? Yeah. And you know, and it's something. And you know, I had um, I was sitting in the doorway in Oxford Street because it's light. You know, what I mean, you've got the lights from the shops. It lights everything up. And uh, there was a Wimpy bar there, and this bloke went in the Wimpy bar, pinstripe suit. He come out. He um, had a bite out of his burger, opened it, spit in it, and put it on top of the bin. And he went about twenty yards down the road, and he was looking back. And at that time, I was so hungry, I wiped his spit out and I ate it. And that, I thought, what kind of person does that? But when you're homeless and you're young, you get propositioned a lot. I used to have a lot of people. I had about, in the 11 months I was out there, I think I had about 10 or 11 of them. All right, son, would you like to come home for a nice bath and a nice meal? And I thought, oh, yeah, I know what you're after. You know what I mean? I said, no, thanks, thank you. And I'll, I'll give that a go. Yeah. I'll give that a go you know it's scary I, did, I made a homeless documentary I slept on the streets for seven days through right. Christmas you know what it's like and I then. stopped for Christmas day I always knew I was going home people always say we're not scared but I never really slept much because I was always on guard because were, there's yeah. people who get stabbed in their sleep yeah. get urinated on shot yeah. on yeah. set on fire yeah. That. yeah but it was to give people an understanding that we're all human like I'm surprised you never turned to drink or drugs because when I was sitting on the streets it's like a world within a world. Yeah. It's like I didn't exist. Nobody cared. Like, yeah. there's so many good people. Don't get me wrong, there's so many soup kitchens, so many people yeah. offering clothes. Yeah. But it doesn't really change the mindset. If you're low in confidence, low in self-esteem, if you've been abused as a kid, 
then it's hard to then run your own house. It's hard to go and get a job because you feel worthless. Yeah. It's trying to change the mindset to show people that they are good enough. Everyone can be homeless like you did, but yeah. you knew you was going home at the end yeah. of it, not knowing what your future holds for you is a whole different kettle of fish, you know? Mm. Um, I just didn't know what not what anything would hold for me. But uh, like I say, I, I got married when I was uh, just 18. I was married for two years. It didn't work. We weren't right for each other. And then... I got married again for another 10 and uh, I was happy with her and but I needed kids I wanted kids and then like I said, I've been with Sarah for 40 years now and she's she's my soulmate she's my best friend she's she's seen me when I'm rock bottom when I'm so low my ass was on the floor like a snail you know what I mean but uh, she's stuck with me and she's a good girl and I love yeah. her a bit and my boys do you respect that loyalty of people who give you love? Oh, they give me that, they get it back, you know yeah. what I mean? They get it back, simple as that. People don't realise that them little things in life are really important. And I, I'm at football, you know, I'm, I've, when some days we've had a row and I don't think one particular person had, had uh, pulled his weight, I would never go and slag him off, but I used to, I used to put my arm around him. You are right, mate? You know what I mean? Because all the words in the world, that little physical touch on the shoulder, little pat on the back, that's what motivates people. You can motivate somebody by doing that. Words go in it one ear and out the other, but the actual physical touch on the shoulder, you're all right. You know what I mean? That, that, goes, that goes well with them. Anyone can use that in life. You just have to understand human nature. Yeah, when I was doing the homeless documentary, it wasn't the money that you were receiving a few pounds a day. It was the the five minute chat that somebody stopped and asked you how your day was, that was the gold for me. That was yeah. to show that people care. Now there's thousands walk past you. Other yeah. people are struggling themselves. I know people that's got two and three jobs who struggle. Yeah. Yeah. They've not got time to really see that there's somebody lying on the streets. I get that people's in a fast paced world, but the people who do take the time and how's your day, would you like a sign me? like, those people are golden. Yeah. These people, you, the world can be a good place as well. There's so much goodness out yeah, there. Yeah, there is some good people, some great people out there, you know, that do a lot for everybody. I mean, like I say, my two mates, the one who's died, Dennis, and my mate Chaz, who's not well now, would do anything for anybody. They, they, they just, there was, I was once told by my mate Chaz, he said, there are two types you will meet, givers and takers, surround yourself with givers. And he's spot on, you know what I mean? And I will remember that for the rest of my days. That's spot on, you don't want to be surrounded by takers. Yeah. The 80s must have been tough with the, the football stuff. Was that with Thatcher trying to slam it down? Yeah, yeah. How Thatcher, was that? Thatcher used it for, um, after the uh, miners, she quashed the unions, it was uh, the football fans' turn. So what they do, they, they had all the people that was um, high-ranking in the clubs to have a meeting with her, and it, it was mentioned in the court case. They went for a meeting, and uh, what they what they did is... Instead of really doing the research and really mixing in with the people, they just picked names. Pick names that people that, that had reputations but were maybe not doing it. I mean, when I went to court, there was 11 of us and I, I didn't know five of them. I said, what are you here for? He said, I'm with you. I thought, fucking hell, I don't even know you. And then we sat there and obviously I knew Andy and I knew Cass and I knew Ted and uh, Paul Dorset and I, and I sat there and I... Who are these boys here, like you know? And like I say, I, I sat there the first day, and it, it, in a court case like that, you get a lot of legal argument. You know, they they sod the jury off and have their little moans and that, and then the jury comes back. But I thought, no. The next day, I bought a big load of paper in pens, and I, I done a graph on all their names. And every time somebody said a bad thing about somebody, I put a cross. And when they say a good thing, I put a tick. So I was working it out who was in the shit and who wasn't. You know what I mean? And it. it and I, I knew we was going to get over that before the end. I said, look, there's hardly bad points against us. It's all bullshit. And I actually looked at the jury because my mum was a bit deaf. I used to like lip read. And I used to watch the jury. And there was two older people there. And, and um, when the policeman was giving his evidence, she looked round and she went, load of shit this is. And I thought, so there, we're halfway here. You know, it was a, it was a nine two, and they kicked one out because he knew one of the coppers. So it, it was a it was very interesting. It was very interesting. I, I it's like a game. The police are having a game with us, and we're having a game with the police. And it's the same in the court. A lawyer, the the QCs, 
pit their heads against each other, but they all know each other. They're all friends. They went to the same university, and it was something that I'm. Uh, I took a lot of interest in what what was going on there, and I thought, so I wish you'd have learnt when you was at school. You know what I mean? I mean, my 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 youngest boy Danny now, his girlfriend's a solicitor in family law, and uh, in all fairness, I think I wish I'd have done something like that. I wish I had the brains to do that. You know, should have listened and turned up more. You know, what was that? What would you have expected if you got a guilty? Ten years. Fuck. Minimum of ten years. What? Yeah, because that's what the Chelsea boys got before us. Year before they got done, they got ten years. And uh, when uh, when we 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 had the evidence looked at by this thing called ESDA, which is they get the paper and they put this black powder on it and they shake it thousands of miles an hour on a machine. And it, anyone who's wrote anything on top on another piece of paper, it comes through, it fills in, and you could see they'd put the dates in months later to make it look more, you know. And also that when you write. People write the same on some of these logs. The bottom ten rows was forced in there. It wasn't natural, you know. So we, we smelt a rat on that. We paid, I think, four hundred pound. They wouldn't give us legal aid to do it. So four hundred pound to have it done, and it come out that he was lying. I was actually in the box the day that they uh, called it off, and uh, the um, prosecutor got up. He was an honourable man. He said, "It's come to light that the." Um, the integrity of the police dogs is, you know, not good. And the, the judge, he, who was the most, he, he had no sense of humour. They picked one with no sense of humour. His name was Judge Hitchens. And there was a couple of really funny moments in the uh, in the trial where they got one policeman to give evidence. He was off sick. And uh, he, he walked funny up to the, um, up to the, to the dock and the judge said, oh, you're right, do you want a chair? And he went, no, he's all right. He said, what's, what's the problem? And he went, piles. And when he said piles, there was, we was all beyond the thing laughing. All you could see was heads going up and down. He warned us all he was going to hold us in contempt of court. And uh, oh, it was funny. He was up there. And then they had, they had another one who was suspended for biting a bloke's ear off in a pub. He wasn't even supposed to wear his uniform when they're suspended. But the high-ranking officer told him to wear his uniform. And uh, but the clerk of the court had a picture of the bloke who'd had his ear ripped off, and as he walked past the jury, he had it facing him. So as he's going by, they're all going like this, looking at it. Unbelievable! You couldn't you couldn't make it up. What's the best West Ham game you've ever been to? The best. Yeah. Oh dear, the best. There's been lots of good ones, but I can think, think more of bad ones than good ones. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, most probably that game, that game in Russia, uh, sticks in my mind because we won and you know they was a great team. And although we got a little bit of pride back, uh, that that was quite nice. Um, some of the cup games we've had in the past have been decent. Uh, we've also had some night shit. More, there's more. There's more things a West Ham fan can write what was wrong than what was right. You know what I mean? As <laughs> uh, simple as that. <laughs> I've uh, spoke to a few people who's been involved in like the football stuff. Um, Calvin Leach, Baz Barrington, Birmingham. Yeah, he's not well, guy. Baz, is he? Yeah, he's. No, he's, I'd like to wish him. Fit, yeah. I'd like to wish him well, Baz. You know, because yeah. uh, Cast told me he's not a bad bloke. So yeah, he's a real good Baz, guy. Baz, if you're gonna watch this, I wish you well, mate. All right. Yeah, I got a lot of love for Baz and him and his Mrs. Tracy. I, I spoke to a younger, a younger boy, uh, Dante. He was he's taught them though, but he's a younger generation. Like, yeah, he but is, they're yeah. all solid all loyal, all sh show your love and respect. Obviously, you wouldn't want to cross these people because they, they would fucking tear yeah, your head yeah. off. But every man I've spoke to who's been involved in what they're involved in have all been solid 100%. Like, mm. Is that what makes it so good to be part of some f sort of family, like some sort yeah, of little yeah. army to I them? I mean, what I would say to you is this. I, um, in the past, I found that the the bodybuilder type of football, once they taste their own blood, they don't fancy it because they like looking at themselves in mirrors too much. And uh, so the, the big musty things, uh, I know I know that Baz does the, the fighting and that, and good luck to him. But, um, and and uh, the, the young boy, Dante, who sometimes has too much to say, but, you know, that's him. 
Uh, good luck to them all, you know what I mean? Yeah. What about um, Calvin Leach? Uh, Calvin's a lovely bloke. He's so funny. Yeah, I've got a lot of time he, for Calvin. I've met Calvin. He's he, been on the show. He, he makes me roll up. Yeah, he's Calvin. funny, man. Yeah. yeah. But a proper proper character back oh, in the day. Oh, yeah, like, great character. Well up front, he, man. He's front got line. a nice chapter in my book. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a good lad. He's a good lad. I've always liked Calvin. Yeah. Why were you never connected with the ICF stuff then? Because they were all younger than me. Because much younger. That was a uh, yeah. They were much later younger. I mean, Colin's sixty, I think. I'm sixty, seventy, sixty-eight. So when you're a kid, eight years older than another person, it was quite a lot, you know. When you get to forty and somebody's thirty-two, it's not so bad. But when you're twenty, somebody's twelve. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So uh, I um. Uh, I love Carlton a bit. He's a, he's a great bloke and Cass. The good people. Yeah, Cass is a legend Cass, as well. Cass has always helped me. Why do you think that West Ham, the ICF, have got such a big reputation? Well, them, them, them boys done it all, you know what I mean? They done it all. Like I say, the people I used to go with, we had no name, we had no gang name. name. We just went, we were mates who went together. And uh, like I say, we was before them because of our ages. I mean, my mate Ted's three years older than me, you know what I mean? He's the oldest one in town, I think, now. But like I say, uh, we're all great mates. I phone him up every Christmas morning, wish him well. And uh, they're, just, they're just good people, and uh, lots and lots of them have been really, really loyal and good to me. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that, that when I had nothing, they was there for me, you know what I mean? So I will always be there for them. All of them, every one of my mates who stood with me all through them last 52 years, whatever it is, out of 62, I went, I don't forget none of them. Some of them come from all over the world, you know. Malta, um, Finland, good people, good people that back me. Do you miss it, Bill? Do you miss the madness of the past? You never. I'll be honest, in my life now is very peaceful. Like I say, I, 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 um, I'm involved with a lot of birds, and I don't mean the two-legged ones. I mean ones with feathers. Yeah, I like that. I like zoos. I, I like uh, animals, horses. Uh, you name it, I like it. But deep down inside, anyone who's led the life I have, you have that passion still in your heart and in your belly, and and you know something goes off, and you think, "Fuck, you know, come on, let's get in there." And then you, you you sit down and you think, hold on a minute, you ain't well, you're getting on, give it a miss. You know what I mean? But you never take that fire out of a man. You know what I mean? It's like if you take a racing driver out of a car for 30 years and you put him back in here, want to win the bloke next to the bloke next to him. You never lose that will to win. But you just have to realise that um, you have to move on. You have to move on. I moved on, you know what I mean? I moved on. I, I, I'm the same as what Carlton said. I um, sometimes think, what's this fucking idiot here talking, you know what I mean? Talking a load of shit next to me. And you, you feel like, oh, give him one. But you think, no, 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 give it a miss. Is it hard to stop, especially being involved for 30, 40 years to then? Oh, very hard. To walk away and go? Very, very hard, very hard. What age were you when you decided, right, I'm... Kind of going to try and live a life of peace and... After I got nicked. Was that? Yeah, after I got nicked and I thought myself, hold on a minute, you don't need this anymore. I, um... I thought if you carry on like this, you're either going to end up dead or, or mad. So I decided that uh, mad was a better option. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there times when... Did you just thrive on it, like... The madness. At, oh, at the football. adrenaline. Once the adrenaline goes, uh -huh. anyone will tell you that's involved in any fighting or sport, the adrenaline's what keeps you going. And it don't matter if you're hurt. You don't hurt at the time because the adrenaline keeps you going. I know Carlton said it because he had the steroids and all that. I never took none of that shit. Mine was pure adrenaline. And it, and that's what worked for me. Did you ever take any second prizes, Bill? No, I didn't, to be fair with you. No, I'll be honest. Never. There is no one you'll get here say that they give me a good eye, I didn't. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. And I was always fair with people. If I beat them, that was it. I wouldn't like kicking. Like nowadays, they do you and they kick you in the eyes till your eyes bleed. I won't do that. I, I used to beat people fair and square. 
I was strong, I was fit, I was fast, and I had a, a punch like a hammer. And that's what it was. And, uh, you know, but... Um, no, no person can t- come up and say to me, uh, I done you, you lying bastard. No, they can't, because they know they didn't. But them days are gone, you know what I mean? Water under the bridge. Were you a target for some firms because of the reputation no, that you had? No, not really, not really. I never felt I was a target. I had a bit of abuse from a lot of them. I used to throw abuse across the road, you know what I mean? At Manchester United, they did it one year for a load of abuse. When I crossed the road towards them, the fucking attitude changed, you know what I mean? But no, it, there's there's good and bad in all teams, and uh, you know I mean I, I I would never have a go at a person just because he sported another team, Tottenham, Arsenal. But if they want to have a go, that's a different kettle of fish. You know what I mean? You ha- you have to have lines to cross, and if somebody crosses the line, that's a different different way, isn't it? Were you ever outnumbered? Oh, loads of times, loads of times. <laughs> a lot of time we bullshit our way out of things. Um, a lot of times we've done crazy things that we shouldn't have done like you know instead of like having it away on our toes we'd attack them before they got to us and even though we was outnumbered and we'd done alright you know we did okay and people say yeah all that and never got done no no find somebody who says they did me yeah that's the challenge I put out to all you all you people are listening find someone find someone who give me a good hiding and then you find people that I did it to and I was fair with them Mostly even helped them up. You know what I mean? That's the way I've led my life. I've refused to be beaten. What's the best scrap you've ever been involved in? Oh, best scrap I've been involved in. Oh. We had a, I had a few when I worked on the door in the clubs. We had some boys there one night that were throwing fireworks around and... Um, really misbehaving and I, I said to them look fellas you've got to calm it down a bit and I, I went in there to throw him out and I said come you've got to go and he went what well, you and who and I looked around and all the others had left me so I said yeah just me so we've gone out in the, the, the alleyway where, where your people come in and I thought well, so I, one of them had a beer mug I thought I'm going to get done here so we had a door and when you close the door the handy angle off the door used to fall off I went to the door. They thought I was trying to do a run. I said that I closed the door and got the Andy Angle and went into them. A uh, couple of my mates got done that was there that night by them. And then I fought the biggest one outside. And uh, the police come and put the dogs on us. We both got nicked. Uh, both went to court and got away, I think, with... Uh, um, I think they have done us just for disturbing the peace or something like that. Because two of them got done and two of my mates got done, it was sort of like... Self defence kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel lucky never to have got the jail bill? I done remand for a few days, and that was enough for me. I like, like I said, I like being outside. I like breathing fresh air. I, I, I like everything like to do with nature. I don't, I don't. When I was inside, I didn't like pissing in the bucket and eating all that shit. When I was, it was in there. I did give the babes in the wood killer a, a, a good hiding in the toilet. Who was he? He, he killed two kiddies in Brighton. He's called the Babes in the Wood Killer. He got away with it. He got out and he'd done another two kids. But when, when he was in there for the first time, he was on remand in Brixton in um, in what they call Fraggle Rock, where all the monsters are, yeah? But he had to come into our our bit in the hospital, because I was in the hospital bit, to, to, to go have a piss. And uh, all the boys in there were jeering me up. Go on, go and give him one. The coppers won't go in there because you've got on, I was on crutches. So in the toilets in there, they have like a, the top so you can look over. And I've gone through the door like a western and I've done him on the pan. You know what I mean? And uh, the coppers come in and pulled me away and, and uh, I forget what Russell Bishop his name was, the babes in the wood killer. Yeah, yeah I, I copped him one. Yeah. yeah he got his come up and. Yeah, bastard, man. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you, when Upton Park, I, I know you get emotional when you spoke about it. Le- I was the last one out of the ground yeah. for the two nights, the, the, the last Saturday, last Tuesday, I was the last one out. And uh, like I say, it was, um, I, I can't put in words what it was like for me. It, it, it was like my life had ended and I'd have to start again. 
And I did give it a go over that new place. I give it three years, and uh, it ain't the same, you know. Like I say, I've got nothing against... I don't like the owners, I want them out, but I just want to have somebody in there with ambition. They didn't grab money. Ambition. Want to be the best. Want to win, you know. Not everything a pound note. Everything is a pound note with that lot. You know what I mean? Gold, Sullivan, Brady. It's all money, 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 money. No. Not for the fans, it ain't. You know, the fans want, want success. We want to have a team to be proud of and win something. Because the feeling when you support a team and they win something, especially like us where we don't win nothing for donkey's years, them days out are fantastic, you know. And people really enjoy them. I've seen the joy on people's faces when we've had good days out. But, you know, that's that's life now, isn't it, mate? Yeah, everything's Who do you support in Scotland? Celtic. 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 Machiavelli, I've had Maca on. I love Maka, he's a funny bastard. He is, he's yeah. a funny bastard. I'm yeah. good friends with Maka now, but um, I know he's good friends with Tony Cotty. Yeah. He was he 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 smashed it with West Ham. Did he not score like 15 or 20 goals oh. when he was down here? But he was a party boy, he was always in string fellows with all the oh. page freeze. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, 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 he was like one of us on the pitch, you know, the way he lived his, <laughs> the way he lived his life, you know. Yeah. Man, fantastic. Yeah, yeah I, I like Frank a lot. Like I say, that season when he scored all the goals when we finished third. But after that season we finished third, that club should have gone out and bought three or four top-class players so they could do better than third. But they didn't do it. Once again, who, who we had in charge there now, I think it was Terry Brown who was the chairman there. They looked at it. Oh, look, we're, uh, we've finished third. That's all right. Next year we do the same. And they didn't invest. They didn't invest in, in the future. We needed to invest, and in and, and all fairness, a lot of people didn't like Terry Brown, but I got to know him a little bit, and I thought he was all right. And that, we had a museum at West Ham at one stage, and everything in the museum Terry owned. And when he fucked off, he took it all with him. So all we had was empty shelves. You know what I mean? Youth cups and all that. Oh, Terry had them all. We used to spend fortunes on programmes at programme fairs. I know he did. And uh, n- nobody can say he wasn't a West Ham fan, because he truly was. Yeah. But these three, I don't know. They say they are, and uh, no, not for me. But you must be proud of West Ham finishing sixth last season. They had a great season. They could have probably yeah, we done well. We well. done well. But once again, we lost the goalkeeper for two periods. That cost us. And we should have bought. We should have bought in the January window when we got rid of the striker and got another. We should have got another one in, and it might have made the difference because Michael Antonio, although he's doing great up front, he's not really a striker. He's a wide player. He always played all his wide foot uh, football at two in the midfield, wide, and um, that I believe is his strength. But we need strikers. What, what Premier League team goes into a season? With only one striker. Everyone has four. Every, every team in any league has four strikers. Not us, one. When when was it? Did it was it Tevez and Marciano? What was the other kid's name? Two Argentinian boys. Remember you just bought them? Um, the one who went... There was Tevez and... Marciano? Was it... Mas, Mas, Mascarano? Right, yeah, something Mascarano like that, yeah. or something. Well, how did that uh, come around? It was a T-shirt, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was something like that. But how did... Because Tevez ended up one of the best players on the planet. Like, oh, did he not go to Man U and then... Yeah, give everything. I think he went to Italy. He gave everything. Yeah. What a player, that. Like. Yeah. The Premiership is all money now. It's all changed, That like. Football now is is not owned by, like it was in the past, the, the garage owner, the ship owner, the billionaires. Every club's got these billionaires. And... Uh, it's like I say, it is a business. It is a business, but to the fans, it's a football club. It's a team you support. It's a team you want to do well. But uh, it ain't for me. You know what I mean? I I just want to see that word I've said to you a few times: ambition. Not not the big spending, but ambition. We want to do well. You know, even little clubs in non-league football have that ambition. You know what I mean? I mean, my boys are involved with uh, Corinthian Casuals in the. Bostic Premier League. My, my oldest boy's the manager and my youngest one, Danny, is the goalkeeper. He's played 500 games for them. And they've got ambition. They're ambitious, but they're amateur. Nobody gets paid. What That boy you played with on Sunday, Kieran, yeah. he plays for us. Mm-hmm. And the other one who come on, uh, 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 one who's bought brothers at Celtic. Not Celtic, at Chelsea. A doy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's been with us. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So... Um, we got ambitions. We don't want to be a bottom team. We want to do well, even though we've got no budget at all. Mm-hmm. I've got to give a shout out to Dougie and what's the other 
Dougie and Terry Sempard. Dougie and Terry, two great guys. I met them at the West Ham yeah. Legends game yeah. playing against uh, Harvey's Eleven yeah. from So Solo Crew. Harvey, great guy. West Ham Legends, great guys. But these two get. I spoke to them after the match. Absolute legends, and they couldn't speak any higher of you, man. That like, showed you so much love and respect. But these two guys were diamonds. I think Terry's is he the cab driver? Yeah, he's a mad cab driver yeah. that always gets on talk sport <laughs> radio. <laughs> Yeah. Do- Doogie's, Doogie's a good bloke and when uh, we had no football he, he got me in at Dawkins to watch a few games like you know because he knows the manager so I had a, in, in the lockdown I had five or six games I went which I really enjoyed nice people at Dawkins Wanderers Football Club yeah they put on that event that was today's money for yeah, homelessness they are really and, nice yeah, people over banks. there yeah. really nice it's, it's the same as like say at Corinthian Casuals we've got nice people we're linked with Corinthians in Brazil you know it'll be mm. Chelsea in the world uh, we have a few Brazilians come over and come way our ground. They bring their their rockets with them. Mm-hmm. Up goes the rockets. You know, I can see our chairman going, "Oh my God, no!" You know, what I mean? yeah. You don't like it too much, but you know, people enjoy themselves. Yeah, the Brazilian fans are on the next level. So is the Italians. They're passionate. Yeah. Did you ever go with England? Did any firms ever come together and go with England? No, never. No, I, went, I went to the World Cup in '82 uh, in Bilbao in Spain when we played. I, was, I went there. I went to Norway when Norway beat us. I'm not really a great follower of England. I watch them on the telly and I think I'm as passionate as anyone about my country. But um, West Ham's for me. I'd rather go to West Ham once than England ten times. It's, you know, West Ham's everything. Oh, the loyalty you have for that club is unbelievable. Like, um, yeah, but I've never that? been rewarded with it, mate. They've never said to me, look, we need somebody like you to come and work for us, try and get... get the fans behind us and that. They've never asked me. None of them have ever asked me that. Why do you think that is? Because I think of they the know reputation. That I'm too straight. Because of the reputation. I'm that you too have. straight, mate. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm too straight. If you're a liar, you get found out. You, you, nowadays, you can't lie about something. Somebody knows about everything. But no, not for me. I, um, I just hope the day comes when they sell up and we get somebody with that, that, that open ambition in their heart to give us back because I think we could not only fill that ground they're talking about making it 65,000 I think we could fill a bigger ground than that if we were successful top four uh, your top three or four I think they, they, they definitely bang out every game and I think they could fill a bigger ground were you gutted that you never got a Champions League this season because yeah, you were linking my boot at a time you know what I mean that's, yeah. I thought oh, I'm going to do it I'm going to see that one game you know what I mean mm-hmm. I didn't, uh, didn't think we'd get in here and win it but I thought that one game would do me and uh, no, it never happened. But I might be with this European thing that's coming. I'll go. I went before when we played the uh, Astra. I mean, it sounds like a fucking car, doesn't it? <laughs> we, we lost to a team with the name of a car. And uh, I thought myself, you know, <clears throat> it was full of bugs. Everyone who went over there, I think it was 500 of us, where their ground was, was full of midges. Everywhere you go, you was getting bit, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's great, but... You know, West Ham have got loyal, loyal fans, very loyal fans. Stick by them through thick and thin. No matter how good they're doing, they still get a good average crowd, you know. But this, this mob in charge, they don't understand. I don't mean they, they know they've got a captive audience, but they don't know that how big we could become. I know we could be massive. I know people that have packed up that went for 20 and 30 years. They'd all come back. They'd all come back. I know a lot of them. A lot of the boys that are now doing this Hammers United, you know, really good lads that are trying to do their best for the club, doing their best for the fans. Fantastic people. What's it like from the kids now who have a tear up to then what it was like in the 80s and 90s? Everything changed. I see a lot of it now. Cameras. Is that that a dying game? Yeah. The the punishments don't fit the crime anymore. You know, if, if a kid had a pie outside a nightclub on a Friday night, you'd get a fine. You have a fight outside a football ground, you get six months, whatever happened. You know what I mean? So I think they're a little bit shrewder. They, they think themselves, hold on a minute, I'm going to get this for doing that. It ain't worth doing. And it is a dying It's a dying thing. I think that things will happen still, but not away away from the grounds like service stations where two coaches might pull in and get out. You know, that sort of thing will happen. Mm-hmm. I think that will happen all over the country. But I think in grounds now, the police have it so sewn up. You know, they know... Uh, where you're meeting, where you're going, you know, who's coming, you know, you turn up anywhere, the police are there before us, you know, 
you've got a couple of grasses on the firm, I think, yeah. that uh, tell them. But I think all teams have. I know that I had some uh, some Chelsea mates were locked in a pub, and a cop come in, and they cops come in, and they fingerprinted them. Nine of them were banned. They got nicked. And uh, this fella said to him, "You know, how do you how do you know we was going to be here?" He said, "Oh, we've got we've got two or three people in with you that are grassing." So, and he said, "Don't worry, we've got we got something at West Ham and all." So what I think they do is they nick somebody for something small, like drugs or something, and they say, "Look, you help us, we'll help you. You tell us what's going on." And uh, I think that's what they do. Yeah, it's very hard to pick one out when he's squealing behind your back, you know. Yeah, there's there's many like that now. It's like when they they said they was with us in the swoops. They supposed to have mingled with us. Yeah, they didn't mingle with us. Although some of their photos they took by their photographers showed them in a group, but they was never with the group. They was walking by and just turned around so they get in the photo mm. and all that. We got the photos. These people would never fit into what we looked like. Never. Yeah, it was terrible organisation. Whoever did it. If I'd have been the commissioner, I'd have sacked him. Mm -hmm. There's more snatches now than coppers, though. That's just the way of the world now. Like, that's the way it yeah. is. Like, there's yeah. so many weak people. Like, there's hardly any loyalty. There's no love. There's no respect. Like, yeah. It's kind of free for all. There's still good people out there, though. Yeah. What do you think back? Looking, what do you think looking back in your life, Bill? What do I think? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't change the love I got for my football club. I wouldn't change... Um, but I wouldn't change the love I got for my family. I would like to have learnt more, stayed at school, learnt more, done something more with my life. I feel that I had something a little bit more to offer than what's in these books, you know? I, I feel that I could have maybe got myself a decent job doing something or other. Um, uh, I don't mind being in front of the camera. You know, I've done it a few times now. I, I quite enjoy it. I can get up and talk in front of hundreds of people. It wouldn't faze me. But it just seems that I spent a whole lifetime of lifting curbs out the road and laying them in and lifting paving stones and lugging up skips with wheelbarrows of concrete. And I thought, you, maybe you're a bit better than that. But that's what I did. That was my biscuit and uh, I've had to eat it. Yeah, but you provided for your family. There's not yeah, I, 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 it's I, an honest living. Yeah, it is an honest living. It is an honest, hard, but honest living. Mm hmm Let's touch on your book, Bill. Yeah. The Man, the Myth, the Legend. How was it writing this and putting this? Three years, three and a half years it took us to do it, me and Moz. I used to go up to his place and he would uh, um, take tapes and then convert the tapes into mm -hmm. the written word. He's very good, Abe Atacha. I, I think he'll go on to become a really good author. I, I, I've got another couple of people I would like him to do. that not, not the same sort of thing as me, but they've done real good in their life. One of, one of my mates, Roy, was a soldier. He's had a lot of heartbreak in his life. His missus died of a very rare complaint. He's, and he's one of my best mates. Roy's an Indian. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a lovely lad. You know, him and his family I'm really close to. And uh, I hope that Moza goes on. Yeah, because it says uh, Bobby Moore was West Ham's leading leader on the pitch. Bill Gardner was West Ham's leader off it. I think Carlton said that, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Because you were in the uh, La Rise of the Foot Soldier as well, the first one, the one with Carlton. I never knew I was in it. I went to the pictures to see it. I'm sitting there with, with me missus, and obviously it started, and I'm watching it, and there was this geezer that looked like one of the Chuckle Brothers. That was me. <laughs> and, and when it came on, and he said it was me, I just laughed, and the picture was quite full. And then everyone looked at me, why is he laughing? This ain't funny. Mm. They didn't realise that it's supposed to be me. I didn't look nothing like that in them days. Yeah. I really didn't. You had the curly hair. I had curly hair, yeah, 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 I had yeah. curly hair. But, um, but yeah, I did look like the Chuckle Brothers in that, but it did make me laugh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I quite I quite enjoyed that film. It was all right. Yeah, the first one was good. They've kind of overkilled it now. Yeah, they, yeah, they've done it to death. Yeah. I like Cal. I've got a lot, so much time for Cal. Yeah. He's a good man. He's solid. Yeah. Going forward for the future, Bill, what's your plans? To try and stay above ground for a few more years. Yeah. Um, I've got a few more places I want to go and visit before I go. What? I want to go, go to um, Lake Constance in Germany, biggest freshwater lake in Europe. I've been there once before. I want to go back there and take my Sarah. Um, I want to obviously go to the West Ham Games, the European ones, and uh, I'll go... I'll go, nearly, I'll go all the away games this year and most probably half the home ones because I'll go and watch me boys play, you know, at Groupie and Casuals. I enjoy that. 
enjoy the people over there. They're all genuine. Yeah. For anybody that's watching, Bill, that's maybe going through a battle, maybe struggling at home or maybe it's fucking close to getting put on the street, what advice would you give for them? Right, if you're being bullied, the first thing you do is you you find the courage in yourself that when the bully starts, you steam into him. You And if you lose, you lose and you get up and you give it a few days and you steam into him again. And in the end, he won't come back. Believe me, they won't come back because that's what they are, they're bullies. You fight back, they don't like it. Always fight back, never give up. And if you're at home and you're unhappy, try and talk to somebody. And, you know, there's plenty of people out there that would help, but be careful because there's lots of dodgy people out there and all. But uh, in all fairness, if I could help anybody, I would. But like I say, if you're a bullied person, get into them. Show them that you're not going to take it. You're not going to take the shit anymore. Well, for coming on today, I thoroughly Thank you. enjoyed that. Thank you're you, a mate. Good man, very Thank honest, you. and I look forward to seeing what you do for the future. Listen, I'm I'm rooting for West Ham now to get into the Champions League. I'd love <laughs> to see you there at one of the games. <laughs> like, you don't know what the, su- the future holds. Like, yeah. like I say, you're 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 West Ham through and through. It's in your blood, and uh, you're a good man, Bill. And f- thanks for coming on and telling Thank your you. story. Thanks God for bless me. you, brother. Thank you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.